that's what this equation is all about, see her. If you can see her, you can be her. And this is our power conversation in every lounge that we do with just amazing women doing wonderful things. And so we decided to call this the algorithm for equality. Um, when you put women in any equation, the equation gets better. But does it get better? We say that it does. But what do women bring to the table? And so I just want to unlock your secret sauces and let's talk about, you know, what you think that is. So I'm going to let you each do a quick introduction of yourself. Um, and then we'll get right into it. So starting with Vita. Hi everybody, my name is Vita Harris and I am the Chief Strategy Officer or a Chief Strategy Officer at FCB Advertising Agency and I work in the global unit. And I'm really excited to be here to bring my perspective to the table. Thank you for having me. That's fantastic, thank you. What about you, Amy? Hi, I'm Amy Armstrong. I am the U.S. CEO of Initiative, um, part of IPG. Actually, a month into my new role of being a CEO, so very yeah. excited. Um, and we represent clients like Amazon, um, Dr. Pepper Snapple, Uber, um, uh, a, a fair around, around the, the world as well. Julie Canova, and I'm one of the founding partners of LNO Research Design, and we are basically a company that is built on the concept of collaboration. Um, we work very much the way a wedding planner or a, a, a master contract. Champagne pop, right when you said wedding planner, pop! Perfect timing. Yeah. That was not planned. <laughs> But um, we basically are a gateway, and my partners and I are the more or less the front end, the client-facing group, but behind us, we have a network of 25 or 30 amazing people, primarily women, <coughs> coincidentally, certainly there are some men involved, but it is primarily a women's organization, and we, we're built on the concept that we want to put together the right team to fit the research problem. Um, Julie and I worked together at OTX for how many years? Seven seven years, so it's just great to come back and, and see all the old OTXers. And it was, you know, we created a lifestyle company, and we'll talk about that way ahead of it being trendy or even knowing what it was, um, and it was quite remarkable. And I also think that it spoiled me in particular for, you know, working outside of the, the excitement and the energy that comes from a startup. It's been, a, you know, an interesting path back, but I've always wanted to come back to that. And then Sarah? Hi, I'm Sarah Personette. I'm the Vice President of Global Business Marketing at Facebook and proud mother of a two-year-old and four-year-old little boy and love being a part of this discussion because I want to create a great world for them that's a equal world and it starts here. Fantastic. And then Lisa? If I can stop coughing. Um, I'm Lisa Grisham, the former CEO of Goop and the former CEO of Martha Stewart and the former founder and CEO of Oxygen, the television network. Um, so I've Just spent, saying. I mean, can't you find a better company to <coughs> I've run? I've spent a lot of time working with women, and I've always had them in the equation. But before my media career, I was a lawyer where I spent a lot of time not working with women. So I have both perspectives, and i um, so excited to be here with all of you today at the Girls' Lounge. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's just get right into it. We will get, you know, everyone, you know, here as part of the conversation. So think of the questions you want to ask, the comments you want to share. Um, this is where it all happens. It's unplugged and it's very real and very raw. So let's just start with you, Vita. Do women bring a secret sauce to the table? I mean, do you find a difference between men and women in the workplace? Absolutely. Good answer. Yeah. Phew, I'm glad I asked it that way. Uh, I think you, there's actually been a lot of research done on the topic as well, but I think um, there are probably maybe three big areas where I see that women bring something quite different. I think one is in their communication and leadership style, which I believe tends to be far more democratic, far more participatory, far more inclusive. Um, than men who are seem to be more around controlling whatever the situation is. So I think that's a big thing. I think what we emphasize in terms of rewards is quite different. I think we're trying, we try to, or I should say I do, um, try to help people find their self-worth in the job environment, um, their passion. I think men uh, tend to be more on the side of uh, reward and penalty 
uh, as their mm. motivation style. And um, I think those are, are two huge areas where there's, there, I think I see a huge difference. But I also think for me as being a black woman, that there is something that I bring to the table that's also additionally different. And you have you you started the conversation with a quote. You said, "If you can see her, you can be her." And I do feel that often um, brown women, women of color, are are missing in the space that we work in. And uh, so I hope that what I am is the ability for others to see and then know that they can be. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's. The unspoken is also really important in terms of, I think, what women can bring to the workplace. But I think it's also just going for it. Like, we need more women of color, and it starts with starting. And so if you brought three other women of color from the conference up here, they'll start bringing their friends, and they'll start bringing their friends. And I had a really bad experience in a girls' lounge. I'm just sharing this. And it was at a four A's, and I was in an elevator with an African-American woman and me, and we were coming and she didn't know who I was, I didn't know who she was, and we were both going to the girls' lounge, and of course I went in, she peeked in, and she left. And I'm like, where are you going? She goes, there's no one like me in there. Right. And I said, there's no other women in there? I said, we're all women. And I said, you're right, there are no women of color in there. I said, but you running away isn't gonna help. Go bring more women of color into this industry, or go downstairs and find more and bring them up here, you know? so like. What do we do about that, well, see her, be her? What you're talking about is really important as well, where um, being in, intentionally invited into the conversation is an important piece. We were talking earlier about what we're doing at our various companies to bring greater inclusion and diversity in, to the table. And one of the things that we've done is just shifted the, what we call it. So, um, and, and then also what's provided, but you know, there's, this whole thing about unconscious bias, which affects gender, race, age, you know, you name it, it's included in that. And so we've moved away from the notion of unconscious bias to the idea of intentional inclusion. Mm. Giving people um, what they need to take an action, not just be introspective about, you know, examining themselves, but now how do you take that and put it into action? So I think it's all about being more intentional in our efforts, whether it's inviting somebody or encouraging someone in an elevator, bringing people from our company that um, we can include in the conversation. But you know, I also believe that the agenda in the, in the various meetings and conferences also needs to mm -hmm. be expanded and greater intention needs to be focused on how we can be more diverse. Okay. Because we are in a conversation about women but you know there there are women of different shades, mm -hmm. and sometimes I think that is forgotten about mm -hmm. or overlooked, and we have to be really intentional in, in how we approach that. We're very conscious, and you know we have a lot of conversations right out there to the point where Michael Roth, um, he is the CEO of Interpub IPG, which is one of the um, FCB is one of the whole, one of the agencies. And he called me up and he says, okay, your goal this year is to get me more women of color in this company. So I called Colorcom. I mean, that's where women of color are. It's a conference with all women of color. And I called and said, well, Michael Roth is now going to be your keynote speaker. And they said, okay. So he's now the keynote speaker. And it's being intentional. And I think it is about being intentional um, to change the numbers. So Amy, from your perspective, you know, do you think that there's you know, the, a difference between men and women in business? I know they're both important, but do you see a difference? I mean, again, absolutely. Um, you know, I've been with IPG myself for 21 years and was lucky enough to keep getting great opportunities that I earned. Um, but as the further up I got in my career, I kept looking around going, there isn't anyone like me at this table still. And even today, as much as IPG has continued to do well to uh, put more women in the, in, in, in the workplace and at higher levels, quite often I'm the only female that comes into the room. And so what are the benefits of that? I think very differently. Um, I have been called out as um, being emotional at times, which you know is that stereotype. That right. How many of you have been told you're too emotional at work? Just, just asking. And I, I was sharing this on uh, another panel a couple weeks ago for uh, International Women's Day that I'm really proud that I am a leader with a heart because we're in a business with people. 
and our clients are people. And so I think if you really understand the decisions that you're making, um, you make better decisions and better outcomes, but you also understand the communications that you should um, make sure that you utilize when you're talking about changes in an organization, whether they're good or bad. So, um, so again, I'm very proud of the fact that you should be more empathetic. I agree with Vida being more open-minded. Um, in today's marketplace, when you're negotiating deals or talking with different clients, you need to cast a room differently. Women bring out the best in certain people, right? So I think we should be leveraging that more, and I, I see it every day. When I was told that there was no room for emotion in the boardroom, so I sold my company to Ipsos, great company, but I was one of two women on a board of 26, and I cared a lot about all my employees having a place, and I was told that there was no room for emotion in the boardroom, so what did I do? I was intentional, and I created a speech called, Bring Emotion to the Boardroom, and I just started sharing it all over the goddamn place, and starting to create a new conversation. Like, I'm not gonna let that define the truth. You have to create the new truth if you want things to change. So I, I appreciate that. And we're going to come back to what you do when you are the minority in a room mm -hmm. and how you are heard. But first, let's hear from Julie. I think women in general are more panoramic in their view of an issue or a problem. Um, I think that they, that they tend to um, look at all the different touch points that their decision is going to impact and take that all into consideration where I think men are more laser focused. And I think just the world we live in lends itself to that kind of panoramic view. If you think about even just recent difficult decisions that were made in the business world, if you think about the GM um, recall, this is an issue that wasn't just between GM and those customers who were affected. It was the customers who were not affected it was the non-customers, it was regulatory bodies, it was the dealerships. There were so many different people affected. And I think that women value teams and team thinking and that they're more likely to solicit information from all those touch points to basically inform their decisions and make decisions that are more likely to work in an environment where there are so many touch points. The other thing I think women do really well is persuade in a very stealth fashion. Mm -hmm. I think that <laughs> women by nature tend to um, peel the onion and get to know and learn uh, the person sitting on the other side of the table from them. And they use that information to figure out what are the pain points, what are the motivating points, what are the points that are going to persuade that person rather than just pushing their argument, they let that discussion be a two-way street. I think what's also what you said was the power of team. And there was a Harvard Business Review article that really pissed me off because it was encouraging women to stop co-authoring um, because it said that if you co-author, you don't get credit. And so it was encouraging women to go back to competing. And, and I wrote an article that just said that's not true. We just need to create the new norm around the power of collaboration and how much more value we can bring. And don't work with people that don't share. Just cut them out of your life versus re re regressing backwards and going back to being competitive. I mean, Another basic difference is that I think women are much more generous in the workplace. They're much more willing to share. They're much more willing to share credit. Not all women, but every woman here is. <laughs> so Sarah, what about you? Well, I. I first was thinking about the question in defining what great leadership looks like today. And qualities that come to mind, I think, that have already been vocalized and that resonate with me are authentic, inclusive, conscious. Those are three really, really important points around leadership today. And I think those tend to be more feminine characteristics. So I want to I want to stop also and and smash the the gender bias here though because Jack Myers wrote a really wonderful book called The Future of Men and I think it's important for us as women who carry these characteristics of conscious leadership, inclusive leadership forward, authentic leadership, honest leadership forward in order to model the right behaviors for both men and women in the workplace and help lift everyone up so that we see 
20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now in the workplace, an environment that is gender equality stated and infused inside of all of the work that we do. Yeah, I mean, listen, we say it's feminine leadership, yeah, not exactly. female. Because there's plenty of women that have masculine and plenty of men that have feminine. Yeah. And feminine leadership is collaborative, compassionate, responsive. And what I actually think is it's characteristics of a caregiver. Yes. And caregivers are predominantly still women. Yes. But there's plenty of women that are not, you know, in that category. And to, and to build on that, and this is why I think women in leadership positions are so critical today, is because we, mo we do model these behaviors. And you think about creating workforces around the world that are more diverse in nature, it means that when there's more diversity, there is more dissonant points of view in the room. And so it requires an empathetic leader, a very inclusive leader, to help get the best out of that dissonance so that everyone wants to stay and continue to be a part of solving that problem. That's why I feel like women in leadership positions today can model that for the world around us. And yet when you look at companies, I mean, there's only 17% of corporate leaders, CEOs that are women. When you look at companies run by those women, it's not necessarily just a compassionate, responsive leadership. So it's not it, just a person that makes a difference, right? It starts... You're, you're exactly right. Actually, you can, you can take that same data and apply it to the boardroom and the conversation that you were just starting beforehand. I mean, right now, I think of publicly traded companies, 19% of the boardrooms are, are representative of women. And yet, when you look at the... The SEC has done this work. When you look at the performance of those companies, <laughs> those companies perform better when they have diverse boards, diverse boards aco across gender, across race, across backgrounds. And that's important to sustainability of businesses as a whole. It's not just about compassion, but I do think, and, and Amy, it might have been you that had said this, the way that women understand what motivates and drive, drives people, I think is critically important to then creating an environment that helps to drive performance and helps to drive success. Yeah, and that takes me to Lisa. I'm gonna ask you a little different question because you've worked in a predominantly female-oriented culture. I mean, Oxygen, Martha Stewart, Goop. And, you know, one of the things we say all the time is we need the masculine and feminine together. That is diversity. It's diversity of mindset. And that men and women, we're all important, we're all equal, we're just different. So working in, an, in a predominantly female business, how did that work out? Like, you know, did you miss the masculine archetypes? Or I think you do. I mean, I just, I think it's really about, in general, diversity of thought. And having everyone be the same and you lack that diversity of thought is, is very challenging. And I just want to go back to one thing we were talking about. To me, it's like if you, if especially women who have children, but all women are, most all women are thinking about it, can have children, you operate on a very different plane in that environment. You're operating with eyes behind your head. You literally have eyes behind your head all of a sudden. And when you run a company with eyes behind your head, and you're looking everywhere all the time. It's very different than what I think fundamentally the way men lead, which is just on the nose. And so when you get those eyes behind your head, and women have them, that really changes the nature of any organization. And on, you know, it's interesting on the board, the board, the corporate board. I didn't even think it was 19 percent. I thought it was even lower than 19 percent. Yeah, just for publicly traded companies, I believe in the Fortune 500. Oh, maybe it's Fortune 500. That's so. Correct. I sit on a publicly traded company, it's a Fortune 500 company. When I first joined the board, I was the only woman on the board. And this is not why this happened, but the stock was in the mid-20s. Stock today trades over 100, and we have half of the board is female. And it was an intentional action by the mm -hmm. CEO to put women on the board. And the way I got on this board, which is really interesting, is they were trying to recruit my husband, who's the CFO, to be on the board of this company. In the middle of the recruiting, they go, you know, we really like you, but we need a woman. And he said, no problem. I have just the person for you. <laughs> and that's how I got on the board. And because I, I, mean, I was the CEO of Martha Stewart at the time, but I didn't think anyway. So the, the, the difference in the conversation today, the company's Hasbro, by the way, the difference in the conversation today in the boardroom with half of the board members female is extraordinary. It's much fuller, people speak to each other in a way that they never spoke before. It's, it's, 
It's astounding. And I think the company has really benefited from having a very collaborative board with management. Yeah, it's interesting because I was with uh, Barry Salzberg, who was the former CEO of um, Deloitte, and we were both co um, speaking at a big event. We were keynotes, and my speech was bring a motion to the boardroom, and his was, you know, climbing the ladder or something. And he pulls me aside and he goes, Shelly, you're, you're going to love this. He said, we hired our first female CEO to run the United States. And I said, well, did you do that to fill a quota? Or did you do that because you want a more collaborative, compassionate, you know, team? And he said, let me tell you something. And he said, I had a board of 26 people. Three were women and the rest were men. And the three women never spoke up. And I said, so what'd you do? He says, I got rid of five guys. I replaced them with five women. I now had eight out of 26. And the dynamics changed completely. And we talked about the why instead of always the what. And I yeah. thought that was but really he, interesting. But he made, that CEO made a really intentional decision mm -hmm. to include women. I was on a panel the other day about the women in the workplace and how to do this Raytheon and New Balance. And both the CEOs are saying, I can't keep women between the ages of 30 and 40 in the workplace. So I'm losing them and then we get to the, the higher level and they're not there because they've, they've left mm -hmm. me. And so what they've done at Raytheon, which is really interesting, in almost all of their jobs, they're, they cannot present a slate of candidates for a job unless there's diversity in the slate. Mm -hmm. So that it is required. And that's the intention of making mm -hmm. it happen. Because if you just sit around and hope that it's going to happen, it's not, not. going to happen. Yeah, it's not going to happen by itself. Can we just pause for one second? For anyone in there, we have plenty of standing space all around. This is a good moment if you want to come in. Not forcing you, but just in case. <laughs> I just want to give you that opportunity to do that. OK, thank you. Um, so let's just go back, and this is up for anybody to take on. Um, we say that you know when we have that voice in our head telling us we can't do this or we're not good enough, or you know if men can do six out of ten things, they're like, yep, that's for me. And women think if I only do ten out of ten, you know, I'm not, you know, it's the only way I could succeed. What we have established in the Girls' Lounge, and Wendy Clark started this, she says, just shut that voice, shut that bitch up in your head is actually what she says. <laughs> but what do you all say? Like, do you have those moments where you feel you're not as good as the guys and you're not as qualified or people on your team that don't speak up when they're the minority? I will happily take that. I, I feel that all the time. and. And that's not, that's not always because of the environment that I'm in. It's because of that internal monologue that we have in our heads. And so one of the things that I do is I, I, I try to help women understand that they need to find their voice and share it out and write down what you want to say and actually make sure that you say it. Mm -hmm. And usually the thing that I also try to commit, and I commit to you guys in, in saying this right now, is that it's just as much my responsibility to find my confidence in that room to be able to share my voice. Because if I didn't, then coming back and sharing this story with you, it, I, wouldn't be, I wouldn't be living my purpose and helping to then encourage you when you might find yourself in that situation to be able to write it down and share it out. And once you share it out, it's amazing how easy it is for the next thought or perspective you have to be able to share that and start a dialogue and have a conversation and really make sure that you're presenting your point of view. Um, so yes, I, I, I feel that and I try to fight through it in service of the broader female community. I think the one thing you said that is really key is find your voice. Yeah. Um, I think I, I see particularly with younger women kind of going through the process of presenting their ideas for the first time, they feel there's a certain form, format or a certain mold that they have to conform to, that they have to be powerful or that they have to use the right buzzwords. And I think really what's key is to find the voice that works for you, be authentic, and, and you know, say what you have to say in your words, not in what you think should be your words. I find that my situation is similar to yours. Um, I, as long as I've been in this industry, sometimes I'm still, I have that voice in me. I have that nervousness in my gut, um, especially when there's something that I may want to say that is counter to what may be sit, be, being said at the moment in the room. I have young ladies all the time coming to me with that as an issue where they've been told 
uh, in their performance review, you're not speaking up enough. I have men who come and tell me that as well. Uh, what I always say to them is something quite similar to what you said. You can, if you're going to a meeting, you can anticipate what that, you know what the conversation is. You can anticipate what that conversation and the nuances of that conversation will be. I definitely believe in sitting down for a while before a meeting, especially if you're very nervous about presenting your perspective, anticipating what the conversation will be, anticipating where you think you can contribute um, in your unique way, in your authentic way, scripting, you know, li literally writing out what you might say. It helps you have more confidence in what you're about to say. Uh, but I also tell women all the time that um, that nervousness is something that even the most seasoned people experience. It doesn't always go away. And for some reason, that tends to give, make them feel, oh my God, you feel like that too? Yes, I feel like that, and I feel like that often. But how do you take it and work it to your advantage? So every time you have that gut that, or that sense that um, you're afraid, turn that into the opportunity to actually fight it by, the only way you're gonna fight it is by doing it. And the more you do it, as you said, it becomes easier and easier and easier. But I just believe you have to anticipate the conversation and, and find your voice by doing that. It's like a homework assignment. I mean, I, I think, first of all, I want to go with you to your next controversial meeting. <laughs> I'm just going to say, you go, girl. And I think that's the amplification effect that they practice in the White House. There's so few women in the White House that you know, a lot of women have a hard time you know, speaking up especially if it's something, you know, contrary to what others say. But if you have a girlfriend or someone else sitting at the table and you have a buddy system and you're like, oh, that was such a good idea, I just want to mm -hmm. reinforce that, that goes, you know, a long way to finding your voice. And I think also, you know, if you go in in advance, even if you don't know what the topic is going to be, but you have a thought that you're going to share that's really smart, put it out there yeah. whenever it happens. Don't wait for the right moment because make the moment that right moment. I just wanted to add, um, I love everything I hear, I'm agreeing with, but I've a, been a very confident person, and as I got higher up in my career, you start to lose that confidence level, and I think it's really great that we're talking about this. And in fact, Shelley, you spoke at a panel at CES a few years ago where you talked about this. And from that meeting, I turned to some of the folks that I reported into, who were all men, and I said, I've got to let you know, I, 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 I don't say what I want to say because I feel like you're, I'm not going to be heard. And it was from that that everything just started opening up. And so really, I mean, I, I couldn't plan this answer for you, but um, it made a big difference. And I think as leaders, we should be role models and be vulnerable and sharing like, yeah, I got to this place because I know what I'm doing, but I don't have all the answers. Hey, you got to go for it. You, got, you know, why hold back? And so I encourage all women to speak their opinions and their minds, but do it in a respectful manner, of course. And what's the worst that could happen? I mean, yeah. if you play out the scenario in your head, like, what, are they going to laugh at you? I highly doubt it. I wonder if you come up with a brilliant idea that could have been lost if you didn't speak up. So playing out the scenarios, and usually the worst one, gives you the confidence that hmm, there's no way that's going to happen, right? So yeah, I, think, I think it's so, I think what you're saying is so interesting because it's kind of what I, what I've always said to the people who work for me, and I've always said to my, I have two daughters, one 26 and one 20, and I've always said that to them, like, what's the worst that could happen if you do that? Like, let's just talk about that. Mm -hmm. There are famous stories about what the worst that could happen when Roseanne mooned everyone at the <laughs> baseball game is one of those stories. They put her up there. But um, I, I... <laughs> but it put her up there. They put her up there, and she did. It was awful, but it was ended up being a very funny story. She, um, she was talked about. Yeah, it was talked about for a long time. Um, I, I think, you know, to telling people that and also showing them that there have been bad things that have happened and you're still there is really great. Like, you know, the time I sent an email out to my executive team with a to-do list and one of the to-dos was to terminate the CFO and she was on the email chain. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely one of the worst moments of my entire career. Um, but sharing those things with that you're yeah. like it, letting people know that you've gotten here, but you've made a hundred zillion mistakes along the way. Just like you let your kids know you've made, which I always think is really important for the kids to know too, because otherwise they just like 
get so intimidated by what people have done and mm -hmm. so letting them know and letting people you know you, you've made a million mistakes. I mean, when we were running Oxygen, we used to sit down and make a list of all the things that we had spent money on that we were sorry about. We do that like once a quarter. Like we, the, before we were a profitable company, we would just sit down and just like write down Here are all the things, and then just accept it. Just accept the mistakes, and letting your team accept mistakes, I think, is also really important and a really, I would say, a more feminine characteristic than male leadership. I love that. Yeah. I think that is hysterical. So I just heard a story literally two days ago from a girlfriend of mine that received an email by accident with her on it that was ripping her. <laughs> And so she writes back to this to the woman. She goes, "I don't think you meant for me to be on." <laughs> right. Honest. Note to self: Do not hit send button to reply all. <laughs> but the um, truth is, it is authentic. It is, and you have to live authentically. So it's good that it comes out anyways. To know that someone doesn't like you, you and, might as well go right for it. <laughs> and I think that's a very authenticity is such a yes. female characteristic in leadership. I think it's easy for women to be authentic. I think you have to be authentic at home. I think you have to be authentic in the workplace. And I think it's when, when young women can look up and see, oh my God, they got nervous before they spoke at a meeting or they made a mistake. That's so helpful to know. I also liked your point that, and you survived. Yeah, right? look, like I'm the, still here. The, the she thrived. Happened. She, yes, she didn't just she survive. She, thri she, she fucking thrived. thrived. <laughs> And Just saying. That is so true. I mean, just talking through the amount of mistakes. Someone asked me at one point, they were like, have you ever failed? And I was like, I, fa I fail every day. Like, every day I make mistakes. I, there was, at one point I calculated how many times I had run for, like, a, an office, whether it was in school all the way through to um, post-college. And I think I had like a 50-50 hit rate, uh, <laughs> actually. I mean, there's no, there's no other right. signal for failure right. than not getting, getting the role, right? <laughs> not getting elected. And so I was like, you just, it, it's what you learn from that and the resilience that, that comes with it that allows me to be inspired by the amazing women up here. And I do think that is, a, to your point, a very feminine characteristic on owning that and being vulnerable and being able to talk about the, the challenges that we, we've faced that helped us get here. I think resilience is a very important word. Yeah. And it's a word we don't use often enough. And I just wrote an article called Vulnerability as Strength because I think that our vulnerability does make us stronger. Yeah. Um, because I think people that think they know it all and can do it all and are perfect are full of shit. You know, I mean, that just doesn't... <laughs> work, right? I, I just wanted to add one other point to this conversation, which is I also get a lot of women who tell me about job interviews and job offers where they receive an offer and the, the job itself might be a bit of a stretch for them and they're really nervous about taking the job and they're considering turning it down because they're afraid they can't do it. And my philosophy has always been, if you're taking a job and you're not nervous, don't take the job. <laughs> because that means that you will be operating in a comfort zone and at your same level, you'll mm. never step into something new. So I try to help people understand that that nervousness is very natural. And more importantly, it's that nervousness that will propel you into something that allows you to grow and a new opportunity. So I just wanted to add that because it's not just about in meetings and in the in the in the you know in meetings or in boardrooms, but it's also about making your choices. And that thing that's operating in you that makes you scared as I don't know what is the th is the thing you latch onto and ride because it's going to take you into something really great. You know, one of the um, there was an article that quoted some data, you know, I'm a data geek. <laughs> I think everyone here is, we're at the research conference. Um, from the Rockefeller Foundation, they had interviewed a group of women that were either at the point in their career where they were approaching the board room, or they had actually been offered positions on boards or C-level positions. And they asked them, those women that, you know, were thinking about it and were looking to make that move, they, they asked them what was holding them back. And aside from the typical stuff like it might upset my family dynamic and all that, 
they said there's no there's no real mentoring. I you know if I once I get there I won't know what to do because there's nobody like like me there. And I, I guess I'm curious for you women who have made that move. Who are your mentors along the way? Well, I mean I had I had one of the my partner at Oxygen was the greatest mentor I've ever had. To, it started before we even started the company. And um, I had a one-year-old at the time, and I was a little bit reluctant to take on starting a company with a one-year-old. And she said, well, it's never going to be the right time for you. That's the first thing you have to learn. And you're going to learn, I'm going to teach you something really important about motherhood that's going to work in our business. Because you don't, I didn't know anything about the media business. I was a lawyer. So she said, you have to learn how to say yes. You need to learn how to say yes to your daughter. You need how to learn how to say yes in business. And... I, 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 I walked away. I really didn't know what she was talking about. Um, <laughs> and I went back, and she said, no, it's not about giving in. It's about changing the conversation to what you want the conversation to be. It's about hearing people. And so if your child's doing something that they shouldn't be doing, you have to figure out how to get them going in the right direction without just saying, no, don't do that, like you would to your dog. And if you have people who are working for you and they're going in the wrong direction, try to find something that they're doing that you can yeah. build on and make it better and you're going to instill a bunch of confidence in everybody that works for you. That was the very first piece of advice she gave me and it went from there, but she was a great mentor. I wanted to just add to yours, Vita. I always say fake it till you commit. Fake it till you make it. Because it's just true, everyone else does. You know, so. Well, men do. All of the course. Time. I mean, All the time. Right, they just push forward and yeah. they, they get it done. Yep. And we can do the same thing if we get rid of that voice in our head. Okay, I'm going to do a quick lightning round. Um, and this might be um, hard. So let's just go for it. I want to know quickly, we all, I say we all have bias. We have either all experienced it, felt it, or felt excluded at some point in our life. Okay, I'll start, because um, this one came to mind earlier today for some odd reason. Um, I would say about 10, 12 years ago, I was working on a new business pitch and um, had put all this content together and was really excited. And, and I was like, but I'm not understanding what my role is in this, this pitch. You know, what, who's doing what? And literally the leader, Amal, said to me, oh, Amy, you're, you're here to play Vanna White. You're not here to contribute and not only I had to pick myself back up you know from you know and not let them see like wow are you are you are you serious did that just come out of your mouth but talk about feeling excluded I felt excluded because my um, talents were being realized even though I did all the work right this is um, a Mad Men episode mm -hmm. yeah so so that was that was pretty fascinating to me and for some reason I had come to my mind what did you today. what did you do I just said that's absolutely ridiculous, and um, and this is the content that I've developed. So you're going to find a room for me to to present this, or I'm out. You know, and and so I I, I did I and I did present in, in the pitch, and we didn't win it. But and, and <laughs> but I you won. Say, but you but, did it. You won. But, and, exactly. And, and again, it goes back to well, maybe there was a shitty team environment. <laughs> I don't know why we didn't lose. Like, because clients always can smell that a mile away. But um, that, that really took me back because I had never experienced that in the workplace, uh, and I was surprised that it existed. So that, that definitely comes to mind for me. I, I feel like I have stories <laughs> that have lived what you have lived. So I will, I will do um, a story from my youth. Um, I was in eighth grade and was looking at um, exploring different high school opportunities versus um, going to the school in my town. And I looked at an all-girls school, and they were talking about how in a classroom environment with boys and with girls, occasionally teachers will teach differently to the boys than they do to the girls. Mm -hmm. At this point in time, I grew up with two older brothers. I had never thought or felt that. And I had never felt it because I wasn't seeing it. It's sort of like unconscious bias training. Once you take unconscious bias training, the, like the the clouds are parted and you start to see your own biases and you start to see the unconscious biases of those around you. Well, the next day, I went back to school. I was in my pre-algebra pre -algebra class and um, I was up at the board 
and there was a boy up at the board next to me. We were working through a problem. I could not solve the problem. And the teacher asked me to go and sit down. And the boy said, can I sit down? And she goes, no, you need to continue to work on it. Mm-hmm. And that was right then and there, actually was like, I'm going to stay up here and I'm going to solve this problem. Um, but I think what that revealed to me is feeling excluded from the ability to go beyond what I thought my own capabilities were at that time. And shame on me for like giving up for that moment. Shame on the teacher for also accepting that. And had I not just recently had that experience, it wouldn't, I don't think I would have recognized it and I don't think I would have added myself back into the, back into the game. Anyone else have one to share? I'll go. Okay. Um, My situation, the thing that comes to mind is um, fairly early on in my, well, I was at a mid-level. And I had been working with a particular client um, that happened to be all male, white males. And um, I received word after a meeting that I wasn't invited to that uh, the client wanted me off of their business. And the reason that they gave was that I was black. Mm. And so it the, happens. The reason, I, the reason I know it is because at the time, the person who ran that piece of business uh, was a white female who was married to a black man. And so she had a level of compassion, empathy, and she was also furious about this. So she told me, and she told management. And um, that was the moment where you know you have a hunch that things aren't good, um, but you can't always jump to the conclusion that it's because you're a woman or because of your race or because of your age. You can't jump there because you don't know for certain. But in this instance, we knew. And so um, my response was to the agency, what are you going to do? I want to know, are you, is this a place where you accept that or not? Because then I need to make a decision about where I want to work. And um, I was removed from the business, and about a month afterwards, they terminated the contract with the client. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I felt that in that moment, I had an obligation that this wasn't just about me, and it wasn't personal to me, Mm -hmm. that this could shape the future of a lot of lives and Mm -hmm. could shape the future of the company that I worked for, the agency I worked for at the time. So they stepped up to the bat and made a decision. I think that's amazing. And I think the reason I wanted to do this was to show everybody that we've all been excluded in some form or fashion. And that's why I think the importance of the word inclusivity, conscious inclusivity, is so important. Mm -hmm. That if we welcome, like diversity, I'm kind of not sure I like that word, because diversity separates people. That's what we were just saying. I I think that's really true, and inclusivity. And, you know, one of the things I say even in the girls' lounge, you know, look at us. We're a minority. In here, you're a majority. And when you have that confidence with everyone supporting one another, it feels really good. And we all feel included. And I think this is what we have to work on in our companies is not working on diversity, but working on inclusivity and that minorities become the new majority because there should be no difference. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that that's just really important. So I think each and every one of you are just badass amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think this is where it starts. It starts by starting and doing something um, to change the game. So thank you for coming. Oh.